Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Moving Past Trauma. Hey, movers. There we go. That's how I start these things. Hey, movers. Welcome back to another episode, another live episode of Moving Past Trauma. I'm your host, Collier Landry, and what's going on? What's going on? Happy Thursday evening, everybody. Uh, I am really excited because we have a very special guest today who is running a little late, but he will be on soon. Um, but uh, that is Dr. Kenny Kinsey from the Murdoch trial, who I am really just so excited to have on here. And I want to give a, a, a shout out to my friend Jared Hardy, who uh, actually is the one who introduced me to him because uh, he had interviewed him for another project. So, uh, and I was actually telling him about the Murdoch trial. So then he sought him out and uh, all of that. So it was very cool and I'm really, really stoked to have him, but he'll be joining us in probably about 15 minutes, he said. So uh, we will wait for him. I'm gonna switch my headphones around too. I hope all of you are having a great evening. Hello to John Swindler, a new member. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, but in the meantime, so how many of you, you can say in the comments, how many of you are familiar with uh, with the Murdoch trial so far and all of that <laughs> that whole kerfuffle. And I've done like several videos about this and it was really cool when I connected with uh, uh, Kenny Kinsey um, because uh, he was really stoked to hear my to hear my story and I mean not stoked that's probably the wrong <laughs> that's probably the wrong thing. He was very moved by my story and my story of resilience and my father. Uh, and the trial and what happened with my mother. And obviously there are a lot of parallels between, um, between my father and Alex Murdoch <laughs> in a lot of ways that I've drawn a lot of comparisons to, especially with this case, in a way where um, you know, there, wasn't, there wasn't this like, <laughs> no pun intended, smoking gun, at least not in my father's trial. And I think... A lot of the evidence in that trial got very convoluted. Obviously, a massive influx of media, social media, uh, conjecture coming from all across the spectrum really convoluted the justice system in a situation like that. So it is, um, it is very uh, interesting <clears throat> um, to draw those comparisons. And that's what he and I are going to talk about today. And also, of course, his newfound uh, fame, <laughs> because before this, he was, uh, you know, relatively unknown. He's been in law enforcement for 30 years, but he was relatively unknown uh, up until this case, which obviously has gripped the entire nation, which is, you know, why I became familiar with it. There's <laughs> many documents, now two document docu-series about the case. And uh, it was pretty, it's pretty interesting. So, uh um, anyways, so I'm looking through some comments here. So I wanted to say anyways, thank you, John, for joining the channel. Uh, hello to everyone who is joining. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm going to put my glasses on so I can read these better. So we're just sort of waiting for Dr. Kinsey to join us. He goes by Kenny, by the way, because he said, my friends call me Kenny. And I thought that was very sweet. <laughs> He's a good Southern gentleman. Uh, I'm in Scotland and watched it every evening from start to finish. Oh, the Murdoch trial. Yes. Hi, Tara Newell. Thank you so much. I'm glad the sound is great. I have been trying to work all of this out uh, over the last week since our last our last podcast, uh, live podcast. So this is fantastic to know <laughs> because uh, the live streaming thing is very new for those of you that do not know, uh, is very new for me. So uh, thank you all for joining so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. Let's get to some true crime headlines in this week. You know, a lot of people, you know, I'm going to do um, something about the Lori Vallow case very soon. Speaking of documentaries, Sins of My Mother. How many of you are familiar with the Lori Vallow case and Chad Daybell? Because I have... And I believe I spoke about this last week a little bit, but I had spoken to a survivor of Warren Jeffs recently. And man, uh, nothing against 
faith or the LDS faith, but obviously the FLDS faith, which is fundamentalist um, a faction of the Latter-day uh, Saints Church, which I think most fundamental religions, obviously, you know, there's been many fundamentalist, fundamentalist movements that have been a little far far reaching in their in their sort of understanding of how the world works nowadays but uh I, you know essentially there was there's a lot of cult things that happen especially with Warren Jeffs right and then to see this sort of translated into the Daybell case and there are in a lot of ways a, a lot of mystery and you know mysterious deaths that happened in that case as well that also uh, ironically parallel the Murdaugh trial in a lot of ways. So I guess this, Lori, I guess they're in jury selection right now. Maybe you guys can tell me in the comments because I'm not 100% sure, but I'm going to be talking about it in next week's episode a little bit, and I'm so glad that I'm sounding good. <laughs> this is great. Hi, Tana. How are you? And hi, Danielle Tamaro. You guys are Patreon subscribers. Thank you so much. Uh, Kim Shoren also and channel members too as well. Thank you guys for being members of my channel, Cynthia Ann. So good to see you here. Uh, also, speaking of my Patreon, so I am offering a April tax day special. <laughs> uh, for the month of April, if you sign up for a year of the Patreon on either the uh, Hero or Thriver levels for the year, you get a 15% discount on the Patreon. And at the Hero level, which is a $20 a month, you get a free t-shirt, shipping included. At the Thriver level, you get a free uh, uh, podcast coffee mug or Mary Soul Super Chi uh, um, uh, uh, mug. Or and at the here at the Survivor level, which is our lowest level, if you sign up for the year, you will get a free sticker. Shipping is included on all of those. Uh, it's a great way to support the program. And what you get in my Patreon is everything that you don't see here on the podcast, that you don't see here on YouTube. You get to uh, sort of have more access to some of the things. That, in my life, I have a lot of my father's letters on there. I actually am getting ready to release uh, a bunch of content that I filmed with my sister. Uh, a lot of you ask me about my sister and about my half sister, and uh, whether I've had a relationship with them. and And I am going getting ready to delve into all of that. I actually have a video that I'm going to put on the Patreon in the next week or so that will feature my first meeting with her, uh, which is shot terribly. <laughs> And my God, it was in 2010 and I was, uh, oh, I was terribly overweight too. Oh, it was so bad. Oh my goodness. I, I shudder to think back then. And uh, it was right when I started becoming a filmmaker and I was like, hey, I'm just going to film all of this because I want to have an archive and we're going to get to see all of that. And uh, many years later, before I made my film, A Murder in Mansfield, we actually traveled to go see my father together in the prison. Now I don't have any footage inside the prison of both of us, but I do have our travels together and uh, our discussions, and um, I'm going to be sharing all that on the Patreon over the next several months. Also, you get access to me every month. I do live meet and greets where you guys can not only – you here you can interact with me, but this is a face-to-face. -face. You guys can ask me questions. Usually they go on for about an hour and a half, and I would love as more members join the Patreon family – to do multiples of those a month and just get everybody involved because it's a great little community that we've cultivated here and it's really, really cool. So it is a fun, fun family event as Tara Newell says. Uh, so yeah, so that's what's going on in my world. It would be really fantastic to, uh, yeah. So that's, I'm offering that for the month of April for anyone who signs up for the full year. There's been a couple of you that have already. Thank you so much for your support and everything that look, I listen to a lot of public radio, so I know the spiel here. Everything that you guys donate helps to support this program and content creation, which you guys are really seeming to love, and enables me to do more lives because I was just meeting with my team earlier today and we were saying, let's do a Monday night live because uh, I think everyone wants an alternative to Monday night football. Unfortunately, I probably don't, but I think it's a good, <laughs> I think a, a lot of people will appreciate that, or at least until football season starts. We'll have our own Monday Night Football event. So I'm going to be launching other lives and more episodes of the podcast that are specifically devoted to reading my father's letters and sharing some more intimate details of my life. And, uh, and then every Thursday, we're going to continue having these guest interviews. 
and it's going to be really exciting. So a lot of really cool content. Your support helps make all of it possible. Thank you so much. I digress on that. Let me take uh, some questions from any channel members that you guys have. I know I had done a post earlier in the members section earlier today and you guys came through and, uh, and had some questions. So I'd love to take those before uh, Dr. Kenny joins us. I'm going to I've also broke these glasses today. The, the lens popped out. It's really funny. Merchant memberships, Patreon, and some amazing merch. Oh my, let's get it, sisters. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda Fisher. Uh, also, when you join the Patreon, you get 10% off merch. So if you want more merch, like Tana bought some merch today. Thank you so much for your support. You get free shipping over $50, and you also get 10% off all merch through the Patreon channel as well. And Forgetful Lucy, please hit thumbs up, everyone, if you're enjoying the live. Please, thank you so much. Uh, hi from Arkansas. Uh, Danielle says, I'm sure you looked fine, Collier. Oh, you're funny, Danielle. Lovely glasses. Yes, yes, Black Widow, they are. They're, they're a little janky. These are the, uh, these are the um, janky uh, uh, Amazon reading glasses, five for $15. Um, oh, yes. So, uh, Mary Hernandez, you saw Tara Newell and I on Surviving the Survivor. Uh, Joel and Carm, well, Carm lost her husband. Joel lost his father last week, so they are in our prayers. But they are back, obviously, doing lives and, and back in the swing of things. Can't hold them down. Have I, uh, John Swindler, well, Tana, thank you so much. I'm glad you love the merch. You are a big fan, and you love how comfortable the T-shirts are. Uh, John Swindler, have I ever visited South Carolina? Yes, I have. So, is Myrtle Beach in South Carolina or North Carolina? I, I'm going to sound terrible. I, I know that sounds terrible. I think it's in South Carolina. So I've been to Myrtle Beach, and I uh, had quite quite a uh, quite a time <laughs> in Myrtle Beach. I mean, like, you, what do you go on spring break, or I think we went on summer break or something. So it's uh, <laughs> shenanigans. Actually, I didn't really have that many too bad of shenanigans, I suppose. But it, it, those situations are a little a little socially awkward for me, at least when I was younger. You know, being around, Myrtle Beach is crazy. Uh, but yeah, so I've been to South Carolina. If Myrtle Beach is in South Carolina, that's right. Oh, Lord. Oh, Tins Fly. You saw my music video. Oh, God, that's like nine years ago. I did that for a project. That song was actually given to me. I think I talked last week about Billy Ray Cyrus a little bit because I had done music videos for him. And uh, that he gave me that song to sing off a record that he never released. And I rewrote it for guitar and voice as part of a a film competition that we filmed on the way to going to a show in Las Vegas, Nevada called the NAB show, National Association of Broadcasters, which sister did I go to the prison with? That would be my half sister who is my father's daughter. And it was the first time that we were all together. Uh, Myrtle beach is in South Carolina. That's good to know. That is good to know. Um, John Swindler. I <laughs> I thought so. I also played golf while I was there. Uh, stop spamming sing signals. Ah, okay. Tinfly, will you ever tell us about your dad's affair? Yeah, I will get to that more in the the podcast, uh, more about my life and more about in the lives that I do and in the Patreon. Um and I and again I'm I'm trying to really figure out a, a really good arc for this program as it starts to really blow up more on my personal story and also more on true crime and my perception and mental health and things of that nature that really that I think are really, really important to me because at the end of the day, when I started this project, just for a lot of you that don't know, I started this project because I was very passionate after making my film The Murder of Mansfield, I was very passionate about and very also very intrigued on why true crime was so popular. And so I delved in and I thought it would be really great to have a true crime survivor's perspective on true crime. And then I just mostly told my own story for ethical reasons, I think, and I didn't want to be like everyone else. But now so many of you keep requesting <laughs> me to talk about these things. So, of course, I did with the Murdoch case. I did the comparison, which I'm going to also do with Alex Murdoch and my father, side-by-side -side videos, much like I did with Chris Watts. And I've just become really intrigued in this world. But for me, also to be able to talk about my family story and also talk about things that are mental health related and true crime are all three things that I, I feel I can have a nice balance about because 
I want this to be something that I can do for the rest of my life, or at least for like the next 10 years. So uh, for it to be sustainable, I need to, I need to break it up into certain things that I think are, that I'm really passionate about. Cause I love talking about what I'm passionate about. And a lot of that is helping others and helping others heal. So I, uh, yeah, that's, um, that is, uh, why I do what I do. I saw there was a comment from a channel member here. And, oh, I can show this. I've just learned this, guys, by the way. I'm sorry. I apologize, but I'm figuring this out. Uh, you already covered my question thus far. Thank you so much, regardless. The weight, I'm sure you're beautiful now. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that is very sweet. So I, I'm, like I said, I'm learning this. Um, I'm learning all this. I mean, while he was in prison. So Tins Fly, I'm going to have to do that. Uh, happy birthday to Kaz Opinions and Thoughts. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's see here. I'm going to scroll back up. And will I ever tell us about your dad's affair? Yeah. So anyways, yes, I'll get into more of that. I also uh, discover a lot more and I, you know, we, a lot of you liked the episode about the tape, which was an interview with the, in prison with the pastor. And that's what I have. I have another two, two interviews with my father here that I've got to record episodes on that are very interesting. So there's a lot of content that's coming through that I think you guys are gonna be really excited about. A lot of it's going to be on the Patreon, then it'll be on the podcast, but Patreon first. And uh, obviously channel members too. Your emphasis on mental health is so needed and I am thankful that you want to help others. Thank you so much, Don Swindler. I'm going to post that comment. Thank you so much, Don Swindler. I really appreciate that for acknowledging that. It makes me feel really, really good. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Looks like I'm wearing my t-shirt. Yes, I am. But this is actually the older, this is actually the Moving Past Murder t-shirt. The Moving Past Murder t-shirt uh, before I change it to Moving Past Trauma. So those will be, those are available now in the merch store, not the Moving Past Murder anymore, but the Moving Past Trauma. And, uh, and some people have noted, and unbeknownst to me, I was very, uh, I was very, um, I, I, I didn't know what this merch was going to be like, but these t-shirts are really, really comfortable. Kathleen Walsh says, that's the one I have. That's so great. Thank you so much. Let's see here. Looks like wearing your t-shirt. Jesus is God. I love your channel as a stay-at-home mom. True crime on YouTube is what I spend time on doing chores through the day. And what you do helps others through your, your trauma. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, where is Kenny? Where's Kenny? I have to do my South Park voice every time I say that. Yes, great quality t-shirt. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. That's an interesting question, uh, Tinsfly. Um, no. <laughs> Would be the short answer. I will be getting into that also more in my story. There's so much to cover. There's so many aspects. It's really interesting when I get these questions from you guys because these are things that I don't that I don't necessarily think about that uh, you guys are naturally curious about. For me, it's just my life. But um, it was one of the things when I set out to make my film A Murder in Mansfield. I was very. I was very. Um, it was a real driving force because I think when you're, when you are trying to, I think when you are trying to um, find answers and really understand and rationalize why people do what they do, you know, i.e. violence of that nature. I think we all feel that we have to, um, that we have to, there has to be a reason for it, right? And I think that that is one of those situations when you are, when you are um, 
try, trying to really understand and comprehend what's happening that um, y you want to justify it. You want to, you want to, and, and this is part of our rationalization. I did a, you know, a TED talk about this for those of you who have seen it, but where we're, we get very caught up in the why of why tragic things happen to us. It's just human instinct. We're trying to be empathetic and we're trying to understand, right? But we have this situation where we're, we're, okay, there has to be a reason why my father behaved the way he did. And I really dove into that to try to find an answer because I thought that my father was very abused. And I thought there were all these things that were happening and or that had happened in his childhood. And I came to find out that what I had thought had happened didn't. And I think that that for me, in my journey, that was one of the things that, um, I think it was one of the things that I really had to process and understand of, okay, there's not a necessarily a reason for this behavior. And I remember, you know, sitting across from him at that table in prison, I, I, that was sort of one of the things that kind of chilled me to, to my bones, if you will, uh, if you will. So uh, you, uh, Kathleen Welsh asked, uh, am I still going to write my book? Yes, I am. In fact, we are going to be... I'm also going to be doing a uh, GoFundMe for that, but I actually have just sort of narrowed down a selection of titles for it as of yesterday. So yeah, I mean, I'm actually already writing it. I should be very honest. It's just a very slow process. So I need to, uh, I'm looking at doing pre-sales and things of that nature to uh, get, the, to really kick my myself into high gear with that. Because it's gonna be, it's gonna be great, but it's gonna take a lot of work and uh, the structure of the story and whatnot. And um, I really want it to be good. So, um, yeah. Am I familiar with Sam Bankin? He is a doctor and expert on narcissist. Uh, narcissist. He is excellent. Yes, I, I've seen Sam Vaknin. Uh, he's interesting because his background, I believe, is in finance. And he was an associate professor or an, uh, an adjunct professor. And yeah, I've seen his YouTubes, uh, absolutely. Uh, there are so many people that are, that to discuss narcissism. And, uh, you know, but uh, he's written a lot of books, but he's written a lot of books that uh, are related in the finance world, uh, from my understanding, doing a little research on him. But his videos are very good. And uh, yeah, I think he's definitely a narcissist, absolutely. Uh, tins fly. So, oh, there he is. Kenny is here. It looks like he is ready to join. And I'll see, I, I'm sure there's a way that I can check in with him and then he comes in. But uh, guys, here we have Dr. Kenny Kinsey joining the program. Hello, Collier. Thank you for having me, friend. Uh, it's so great to have you. Now, were you able to hear me the whole time talking? I could. Yes, sir. Oh, fantastic. This is so great. This is so great. Thank you so much, Toshiko, for Super Sticker. Uh, hey, man, what's what's going on? I'm so grateful to have you on the program, my friend. And I'm so grateful that we got connected. It is my pleasure, sir. I hold much respect for you and your journey. And I can just tell you, for me, it has been a wild ride. Wild, unexpected ride. Oh, yes, it has. Oh, I, I, you know, that was one of the things when we connected, we, we discussed was your, I mean, let's just get right into it. I mean, I, that is definitely something I want to talk about is, did, did you know when you got involved in the Murdoch trial, because you were called specifically in by the prosecution to debunk the two shooter theory, is that correct? Well, actually, Collier, I was called in to look at a specific piece of evidence, and it's been so it's been beat up so bad down the road that I'm not going to mention it. It wasn't brought into trial, mm -hmm. but that was my sole purpose to look at this piece of evidence. They had a great expert looking at it, and we had a difference of opinion. I didn't call that expert wrong. I just laid out the reasons I could not form that same opinion and the next thing you know i'm wrapped up in it and i am the expert 
<laughs> that is so wild. So, so you, so it is my understanding. I did not watch a lot of the trial. I watched little highlights. I saw your testimony. I thought, oh, this is this is really interesting. Bits and pieces, right? Catching it through YouTube and, and different platforms, but you did a a whole. And correct me if I'm wrong. A whole reconstruction of what happened there at the kennels. I did. And I'll tell you, my report's out there because the uh, defense filed a motion and put my report out there. So it's no secret. I was hired to look at a shirt. I was I was hired to That's look right. at the right. the infamous shirt because <laughs> it's splatter. And I remember. Oh, now I remember. That's right. Because that was before I was even following the trial. I yes, just sir. saw something. Oh, my goodness. The shirt, that was it. And and I said, you know, I'll help you. Uh, I, I'll do anything to help law enforcement. I'll look at it, but I'm going to give you an honest opinion. And one thing went to another. And in a few days, I was in the war room and I was with those great men and women that put that case together. And here we are five months later. That is so, okay. It was the shirt because I remember, oh, this is so funny. I remember seeing because I became familiar with the Murdaugh trial because my uh, my adopted mother, Susan, she was very into it. And she lives in Ohio and she has friends in, in the Carolinas and she w was very, very into it. And it's like, oh, were you watching this? And I watched a documentary called uh, Low Country, the Murdaugh Dynasty, which is yes, on sir. HBO Max. And I'm as a documentary filmmaker, I am very. Uh, anything that comes out of HBO, I'm like, if it's a documentary, Sheila Nevins over there, not to get in the entertainment industry, but like they do a wonderful job at HBO of making great documentaries. And it caught my attention. And I watched it and, I, and it was actually the thing at the very end of the last episode when he's on the phone with Buster Murdaugh and he was talking to Buster about, because his girlfriend didn't want to come to the phone. And then he was saying, remember when mom, uh, mom used to get buzzed up because he was talking about drinking and mom used to get buzzed mm -hmm. up and, and Buster's response was like, yeah. And I was like, oh my goodness, this sounds like my father to a T. Wow. And I, and I tweeted on Twitter. I went, this, this guy sounds just like, I think I made a video on it. I, I just something in my initial reaction of like, he reminds me of my psychopathic father. And then I saw the thing about the shirt. And the spray of blood, I believe, is what, what you guys were discussing mm -hmm. and how it could come. What it, and I just remember going, this is some nonsense because it, it, it reminded me of the concrete splatter with my father's case that was on right. the wall, which right. they, you know, when they were down in the basement, that was the thing that was. Oh, because the whole basement was redone, right? So my father had right. buried my mother underneath the floor, covered with indoor outdoor carpeting, shells, repainted everything. It was that one concrete splatter. And that became a sort of point of contention. Well, how did you see that? What is this? Why did you dig up the bot? You know what I mean? With the defense. Right. And I just remember thinking, God, it, does it always come down to a splatter? <laughs> I mean, and, and just the way that uh, they, the, the posturing that defense attorneys or attorneys in general do around these things to just completely throw a jury off. And I just was like, it's wild. Well, you know, I was really, really careful, Collier, not to throw any of those original experts under the bus because I hold them in high regard. Yeah. Why, why they made their call, that, that doesn't really affect me. And like I said, I didn't say they were wrong. I just said, I can't form that opinion. And... You know, I said, these guys are going to tell me to pound sand. They'll never talk to me again. I'll be the enemy of the AG's office and my friends at SLED. And look at me five months later. You know, it worked out. I was able to help those guys uh, secure a conviction. And I owe all that to the jury and those men and women that put the case together. But that's a really good outlook of how you behaved of how you conducted yourself, not, not behave, but how you conducted yourself. Because you're a professional, you're not gonna engage in, in these you know, low ball tactics and you're gonna do your job because you also realize that you're gonna have to work with these people again. And I think that a lot of times when, in, in, in my analysis of looking at true crime cases, there's a lot of vitriol in the public. There's a lot of vitriol with, with, um, with, uh, 
there's a lot of vitriol with with observers of these cases, content creators saying, well, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? And we have to understand that y'all are part of a community that needs mm -hmm. to work together to get justice. Whatever that looks like, whether somebody is innocent, whether somebody is guilty, whether a family is trying to, to get answers for their lost loved ones, which we'll get into in a moment. And I think that uh, that is something that is really, that, that people just don't take into account. So for you to do that, obviously, I mean, you've had 30 years in law enforcement, but you're from Georgia. You're not even from South Carolina, correct? No, sir. I'm from South Carolina. Been here my oh, whole from, life. Oh, yes, okay. Sir. Why been here my whole life georgia for some reason it's probably the accent i don't know <laughs> that's what it was there we go because i have such good knowledge of uh of southern accents in southern california <laughs> oh that's funny um so so talk to me about how your life has literally changed five months later the whirlwind of this entire fiasco friend i met uh jared and he introduced me to you and I've met so many. I've always my whole career. And I'm telling you by design, I have stayed away from the media completely. Uh -huh. uh, I appreciate them when we have cases, you know, missing children, that kind of thing where you need information and you use them to your advantage. But me, myself, I have dodged interviews, accolades, that kind of thing. So I was a little standoffish. But I can just tell you, it has been 100% phenomenal. Uh, I'm like, people want to talk to me. Uh, the social media thing, I never was on social media. And I'm up on all the platforms now, and the response has been phenomenal. Uh, I tell everybody, you're not really talking to me in real time. Now, you're talking to my agent, which I have been sleeping with for 27 years and married to for 20 but every night we have to go through my list of questions and we sit there and we answer people. And uh, it has just been wonderful, Collier. I, I couldn't ask, you know, here I'm looking for the sunset. I couldn't ask for a better time. And it's kind of given me a renewed push. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go a couple more years, maybe not carrying a badge and a gun. You know, I'm going to drop the badge part. I'm still going to carry a gun. But right. it's, uh, it's <laughs> phenomenal. I got people reaching out, want me to help them. And, and, you know, sometimes they don't want the real answer. I'm just the real answer kind of guy. I can be wrong, but I'm not going to tell you something that I know is wrong. Yeah. And it, and it just humbles me. And I feel honored that, you know, a lot of people, as I mentioned in the, one of my sayings, they don't know me from a can of paint, but <laughs> they are, they are, I mean, lots of folks call your lots of people. It's, it's, I'm inundated with people want me to just look at their cases. And I have lawyers, you know, calling me wanting to give me retainers. And I'm like, look, I will review your case, but I don't want any money right now. Uh, let's, let's look at your case and see if I believe I can help you because I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy to take your money, non-refundable, you know, and, and not be able to produce for you or at least not give you what I think is a good work product. So it is, it's been wonderful. It's allowed me to keep my integrity. And uh, I look forward to the next 10 or 12 years. I really, really do. That's incredible. And I think what you just said with the integrity part is, you know, I, I don't want to get into the state of ethics in the world around us but that's something when i talk to like you know especially young people right young men and women who are trying to navigate through life and you know when you're 20 you don't think about when you're 40 <laughs> at least i didn't, no. I, didn't think, I, I didn't think i was gonna make it to 40 i didn't plan i didn't plan on making it to 40 and then i become <laughs> a father and now you've got to make it you know <laughs> Yeah, I remember just even just processing my own journey. Like, I, I'd be lucky if I made it to 40. I don't even think I thought that I was going to make it to 30. Just of everything that I've been through, right? And just to be vulnerable about it, I suppose. I don't think I've ever said that out loud. But I, um, I, I talked to them about the decisions that you make, how that you want to be, you need to be able to look yourself in the mirror at the end of the day. 
and, and at the end of their life. And I think about like when I was a child making that decision to testify against my father, going to law enforcement and saying, hey, this is like something's up here and and getting that one detective to ultimately listen to me, how key that was and how I now look back at that and I don't have. I have no, I have no regrets about what I did. No, and I, I, and I say to people, and this is very morbid, and people will get mad at me for saying this, but if I walk across the street and get hit by a bus tomorrow, I'm going to leave the world with a smile on my face, and not only because of the things I was able to do out of what I, what has happened to me as a child, and, but also just because I did the right thing. And I'm like, I, I know what, that that was, and, and I think so many people lose lose sight of that, and I think that's what really intrigued me with the Murdoffs. <laughs> is did you know them at all like i mean i'm sure you had to have being in south carolina right i have heard of the dynasty and i actually my mother uh she's no longer with us but she lived in hampton she was a police officer oh, okay. and i knew i knew who the murdochs were and i knew the father i knew mr randolph i tried i mean briefly i tried a murder case with him in 07 and he seemed like a great guy. It was quick, fast, in a hurry. I was on the stand, off the stand. They got a conviction. It was over. And I remember going, I've never seen a trial operate this way. I didn't question it then. But, I mean, it was it was almost, this is the way it's going to be. If they don't believe you, they're not going to believe the evidence. I was on the stand 15, 20 minutes. I was down. That was it. And that is the only connection I ever had. I know... Uh, Alex's sister, I worked with her briefly. She's a victim's advocate and a very okay. nice, sweet lady. I worked with her for a couple years, but other than that, my exposure to them was minimal. Interesting. Interesting. Because I, I come from a small town. It's called Mansfield, Ohio, and I, I lived there ever since I was five years old, right? And I, I think about, you know, the, and, I, and I talked about this, like the intergenerational trauma. And I remember when I was watching those documentaries, like, the family being in power for, you know, a hundred years or something. I mean, you think back to the early 1900s, late 1800s yeah. and the, and the solicitor's office. And I just thought, you know, it always goes back to absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And why do you, so do you, did they, even if you didn't know them personally, did they have, were they liked or were they feared or a little bit of both? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I only it, know what they say in the films and, but like that's a movie. So I don't know if that if they're just pouring it well, on for the cameras or not. You don't want to cross them because they're, they are very powerful with their law practices. And, you know, the one way to hurt somebody is sue them and take every dime they have. Yeah. They are really, really powerful in that aspect. But it's like, you know, we have a we have a senator here who's a very good defense attorney in my area. It's hard to find 12 men or women that he's never done a favor for to sit a jury. So it's kind of the same way. It's, it's hard to find someone in Hampton or the surrounding area that uh, the Murdoch family hasn't done something good for but then you don't want to cross them because it's quick, fast, and in a hurry. I mean, the legal way. I, I don't know about all the other bull jive, but, yeah. you know, the legal way, they will really hurt you, and, and that's in your pocketbook. Yeah, I mean, if you if you can hurt them the legal way, why, why would you go they're very doing bull they're jive? Very, <laughs> yeah, they're very effective. You know, some attorneys sue for tens of thousands. You know, you can look at their record, uh, and, and there's a lot of awesome attorneys, powerful attorneys that's involved in this whole process. But I'm speaking of them in specifics. You know, their 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 loads were big, their awards were big, and it's it's great when you're when you have that many connections when you have to see the jury that's got to say whether you get paid or not. And it just went on forever and ever. And I think uh, Mark Tinsley said it, who I have mad respect for in the trial. When you have the majority of the docket, <laughs> when you are, are you represent a majority of the docket, it's hard to say you're not getting paid, Collier, when you're the majority of the docket in that area. Wow. 
And what was his role? Was he like the leader? Because because the, the brothers are lawyers too. It's a whole family. They're all involved in the legal business, right? Right. It was it was started by their grandfather in the early 1900s. Yeah. But now they have three or four partners uh, in the firm and him and his brother, Randy. And I think they were all equal. I'm not sure of that. I think they were all equal. Yeah, P-I-M-P-D. I just yep, thought it was weird. Pimped. It was pimped. I was like, I said, <laughs> I said, is this pimped? I, I said, this is so, the, I, I mean, this is, a, those are things that I always say. That's how you know God has a sense of humor. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Boy. Boy. But I mean, they were, if you really felt you were wronged, that is the firm you would go to. And, you know, the per capita income in that area is something like seventeen or $18,000 a year. So they're big money, big, big money. It's a very rural area. It's not a lot of jobs, not a lot of companies and businesses there. And, and they just, they helped a lot of people. I, I can't take that from them and still helping a lot of people, you know, uh, but you, I understand you don't want to cross them, especially in the courtroom. So they weren't all bad then? Oh, no, sir. They did a lot of great things from what I understand. And that's, therein lies the problem. It's hard to find a juror that that firm or one of those guys or one of those other great attorneys that's still there hadn't done something for you or a family member or somebody you know. So it's almost like complete control. Hmm. That's wild. That's wild. It's a dynasty, and I didn't quite understand it because I didn't watch any of the documentaries or anything until after the trial. I didn't want to bias myself or, you know, preconceive some notions. So I uh, binge watched everything <laughs> for about two weeks, and I'm like, wow, this is a this is a big deal. I mean, I, I got friends that would love to be in that position, you know? Yeah. I but you know I always take it with a grain of salt because it's like you know, those documentaries are let's just keep it real those documentaries are really by, by us city folk, you know what I mean, <laughs> and we're, we we don't understand you know we you know and mostly people that live on the coast right so we have sort of you know we have different ideas of what corruption looks like, you know what those things that we put our own spins on it I think you know, for good or bad but I think, it, uh you know <laughs> when you see it. It's just, it, I was like, I, I was like, there's gotta be more, even more to this, but they, you know, they, because they do over dramatize with true crime a lot, but that's very, very interesting on. They just, they, they had a good reputation too. Cause they make it sound like, yes, Oh, sir. it's all bad. They're oh, they're, they're doing all kinds of shady business, which I don't doubt, you know, uh, of course, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Um, so, now, leading up to the – so before this case, obviously, and it just – because, it, I mean, this completely transformed the town, right? I believe so, especially Colleton. Not so much Hampton where the actual office is at, mm -hmm. but this put Colleton on the map. I mean, this was major tourist attraction, news trucks as far as you could see them, yeah. food trucks. You know, it, it, they, they actually couldn't feed enough people, so all these food trucks come in. Hotels. I mean, they don't have a lot of hotels in Walterboro. I'm sure all the hotels had plenty of business. Uh, it was a big spectacle, really and truly. And I think they did wonderfully. The town of Walterboro welcomed everyone in. And it was really, for a bad situation, it was a warm environment. And that's why they have all those people left or are they hanging around till August till new things happen or the, the situation with Steven's family, which we'll get into in a second. Are they, or did they all just pull out now? It's like, okay, now we're back to normal. Is it back to normal? I rode through yesterday. I'm actually helping them with a, uh, another case, not a big case, but I'm helping the men and women down. They just giving them a little guidance and I rode through there and uh, it looks normal. But I bet you, you let a date come out for the white collar crimes and the circus is back in town. I can, I can assure you. And they will meet the challenge. I'm, I'm, I've never seen a small town react that well and, and ad lib and make everything work. But it really, really was a great place to visit during this spectacle. Yeah, then you think about like, well, you got to tell Creighton Waters too. I got guitars behind me; he can play. I, I am. Hey, I put that on the list. I'm looking <laughs> over your shoulder. I'm putting it on the list. 
Yeah, I loved it. I would love to speak to him. He just, I, it's, it's so funny because I saw him playing guitar. I was like, is that the guy? I'm like, oh, and it, as a musician, I went to music school. I'm like, oh, that must be just feel so good to be done with this trial. Just be like, I just want to jam out and just not think about anything right now. Collier, I was with him so many nights down there, and I, I, I can't tell you the wild, mad respect I have for Creighton and A.G. Wilson. But Creighton, as Mr. Wilson said, was the guy in charge. And I can't tell you how many nights I spent down there, uh, you know, beating different theories and, and, and working on presentation and that kind of thing. And he always had two or three guitars sitting in the corner and a little, a little amplifier. And I said, dude, are you playing these? He's like, every chance I get. Well, I spent hours and hours and hours with him and I never seen him pick one of them up. So when I seen the video circulate and I said, he really can play. Yeah. <laughs> he's oh, really yeah. pretty good. <laughs> oh, yeah. He said he'd been playing since he was like 15 or something. Oh, yeah. He's a wild man. He is a wild man on the strings. Uh, I, I saw him a uh, video of him at St. Patrick's Day Festival here in Columbia, South Carolina. He is ready for the big time. He's awesome. That's so cool. How is so? I mean, obviously, this was probably the, was this the biggest case of your career? It was the most uh, publicized case. I wouldn't say the biggest. Uh, yeah. I've had numerous double homicides and mm. I've had, you know, uh, mm. connected people and, and help. You know, you don't always get the same homicide with a serial killer, but me and my teammates at SLED have worked, you know, homicides due to a serial killer. So I, I wouldn't say this is the, the biggest one, but it's definitely the most publicized. So for you, what was the most personal case? If you, if you wouldn't mind sharing children, this, yeah, Chil children tear me up. Uh, and they say, God will only give you what you can handle. Yeah. And I can say, call your, and, and, and I want to go on the record. You know, everybody thinks I've worked 850 plus homicides that that's not true. And I testified 850 death scenes, uh, you know, some of them's accident, suicide, unexplained, uh, you know, homicide, but only about a dozen children. And out of all those numbers, and I am so thankful, you know, that, that I was able to handle it. It's always tough when it's a friend. I've worked several suicides for friends, uh, mm -hmm. several police officers that I knew, uh, those always touch you, you know, uh, suicides I, of I, law enforcement, like, Law oh yeah teams? yes sir I, i've worked law enforcement suicides and i've worked just general friends that weren't in law enforcement that you know at one time or another had told me i'd never do that if i do what you investigate it and, and i did and when i did they did do it so i mean i've come to understand that fine line that we all walk and it may be chemical electrical hormonal whatever but any of us can step over that line at any time and if you don't have intervention, sometimes that's what happens. And, and I've come to understand that. So what do you think is the balance? Because as you just said, 850 death scenes and then how the children affects you. And again, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. We've all heard that before. But realistically, how do you cope with seeing that much? Because if I, if I can do my math correctly... That would be what thirty a year over a thirty-year career. Well, and actually, it's, tw it's actually it's twenty-two years. 20, but 22 uh, years. I've only worked crime scenes twenty-two years. I've been in law enforcement for thirty, but uh, for several years, you know, we I would respond to one hundred and twenty-five to one hundred and fifty. And what we did, we had a, a primary backup system, so we had a partner, and this scene you were primary and that means you do all the politicking and all the decision making and the partner the, the backup is your uh your gopher you know I, I, we call it something else that starts with a b and ends with a ch but that was your gopher and then the next crime scene you would swap so if something happened to one of you you were both involved and i actually had a partner that was very near and dear to me who passed away from an illness and I inherited all of his scenes that I've worked with him, but I inherited them all. Mm -hmm. And up till about two years, I've been gone from sled 12 years. 
And up till a year or two ago, I was still testifying for, for my buddy Bruce. So, wow. you know, it, it works out and it's a good system because if something happens, as long as nothing doesn't happen to you two together, you've always got someone that can hold that integrity and testify to that evidence. So I did, you know, several years, a hundred plus in a row, four or five years. And then it was, you know, like you said, you know, 30 here or, uh, you know, 25 here or whatever. But, uh, and one year here in my county, we had uh, close to 30 homicides. And for every homicide, we had a suicide. And then for every suicide, we had two to one uh, industrial accident. So, I, I mean, you, you add them all up and I didn't really keep a list. I just update my CV every once in a while. And uh, yeah, it, it could be way more than that. I, I don't know. But uh, I, some people said, uh, they had an expert that was a consultant for uh, one of the shows and I'm not kicking him in the knee, but uh, he's been in the business 24 years, 12 years as a civilian and 12 years as law enforcement. And he had this wild number up in the 20 thousands. Wow. And, and, and I said, I asked the uh, producer for this particular show. I said, do you realize that is a crime scene every day, seven days a week for 24 straight years? I said, that's not possible. Uh, many crime scenes last three, four, multiple days. You have to have downtime. Those numbers are not possible. So I've always tried to keep true numbers, and I'd rather undercut them than, you know, yeah. fabricate or overcut them, you know, uh, overproduce them. But uh, you got to look at a person's numbers. And when I talked with that producer, she said, wait a minute, let me do the math. And she come back. She said, and this guy's younger than me. She's like, yeah, you're right. Those are numbers. I said, and that's like a sheriff or a police chief claiming the homicides that happened in their department. <laughs> you know, I worked seven, you know, one of the big cities, Chicago, I worked 700 homicides last year. No, you really didn't. Your men and women worked them and you're using that number, you know, in your resume. And, and I'm not blaming them, but uh, my numbers are true numbers, boots on the ground, you know, hand sanitizer afterwards. My numbers are true numbers. Wow. That's interesting. Well, Hey, I guess it, it's true to form in all, all aspects is all very political and all, all about a oh man. Yes, sir. That's wild. That's wild. So, um, speaking of, of cases that get, uh, with children, you are now, well, actually, let me, uh, let me ask you something. So you said you left sled 12 years ago. So what are you, you, so you were a part of sled and just for those of us that I'll let you explain, what is the difference between SLED and everyone else? SLED is the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, commonly known by the acronym SLED. And it is our state police. It's our version of the state police. It's like the uh, GBI in Georgia or the SBI in North Carolina. They uh, handle all the counterterrorism. They own the only police laboratory in South Carolina. Well, no, we have a couple more. They own the state police laboratory. Uh, they're an accredited agency, hundreds and hundreds of men and women, and they are assisting agency. They are the ones that put out the flyers and they run the uh, all the computer programs, uh, NCIC, that kind of thing that filters down from the FBI. And they are our version of what some states call the state police. They have jurisdiction in all 46 counties and they run all kind of federal task force and, and they partner with everyone. And if you're a small department with no resources or limited resources, you call them and they're coming. And that is, that is their role. And I was there. I worked my whole life to get there. I worked for a wonderful man by the name of Robert Stewart, who's still in the game. Chief Stewart is a famous, famous chief and a very fair man. And he runs a consulting business now also, and I get to see him occasionally. Uh, but he, he was great. He brought me up. He hired me. He gave me a great package uh, when he brought me in because I already had several years under my belt and it was just phenomenal. And then came the uh, stock market problems and, and the economy of 09 and 2010. And uh, I hung in there a little while, but I had, my son was born in 07 and, you know, everything hit and they started cutting out overtime and they limited the use of your vehicles and I was in, you know, four or five counties a day and a newborn here at home. My wife was trying to uh, take care of. 
And I had missed all that time with my daughter growing up. And I said, I can't do it again. So I came back home and, and opportunities opened. And then my sheriff decided to run for office. And he asked me if I'd come back. And I thought about five minutes. I've worked for four sheriffs. And two of them ended miserably for the sheriff. But uh, this is a good man I work for now. And, and he gave me a great opportunity. And I came back. And I always said I'd never come back unless I was running the department. I'll never get back in sheriffing if I wasn't running the department. And a year down the road, you know, I'm his number two. And I'm running the department. And he's the politician. And, and it's just worked out. It's, it's been wonderful. It's been a wonderful ride. And I don't really regret any of it. But my heart will always be a sled agent. It'll always be with the men and women at SLED. So is SLED basically the, the sort of the state equivalent of the FBI? Yes, sir. The, yeah, they, are our, they are our equivalent of the FBI. There we go. Uh, somebody just asked that, so I put it up on the screen. That, that was under, yeah. that was what I, that was sort of my understanding too, but I'd much rather have you explain it than me. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, okay, so so obviously you're involved in another case, which, which I mean, the, the rabbit hole of the Murdoch's just sort of just keeps going and going and going. I mean, it is the gift that keeps on giving for the tabloids and everyone. And I just watched a recent interview with you on Court TV about this exhumation that happened last weekend in your involvement in the Stephen Smith case. Are you feel comfortable talking about that a little oh, bit? Oh, absolutely. If we get to a point I can't talk about, I'll stop. Okay. Absolutely. Fair. Um, so I guess one of the things that caught me in your interview was exactly when you were explaining this road and I can't remember or something river run road, I believe. Sandy run, uh, Sandy run road. Mm -hmm. And how you were explaining it is in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yes, sir. And, uh, and I, you know, I, like I said, I grew up in Ohio and I know what those middle of nowhere roads look like. And I think w one of the things that I thought was interesting is I had seen the statement that had come from SLED a couple of weeks ago where they had said, we've always been ruling this as a homicide. Was that news to you? I believe I believe we're everyone is losing something in translation. I believe they are investigating it as a homicide. Uh, as far as I know, the original death certificate still says undetermined, and there's only you know there's only five things it could be: a uh, suicide, a homicide, an accident. Uh, undetermined and there, oh, and natural, there, there's one more, there's only five. So undetermined is what they put when they just can't figure it out. And I'm not the one in charge of this thing now. And I'm not the one that makes that determination, sure. but to me, undetermined is better than getting it wrong. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's better than getting it wrong. It's saying, I have some reservations. We need to do a little bit more investigating, but I definitely think there's a reason, a probable reason to frame this as a homicide and see where it takes you. Because obviously it was framed as an accident and it got them nowhere. So look beyond that. And if it comes back towards something else, then you've covered all the bases. Interesting. So then the conjecture saying that it was ruled as like vehicular manslaughter or vehicular is that just is that just nonsense? Well, anytime in South Carolina, we have a, a charge that's failure to render aid. You, if you leave an accident without rendering aid, and it is, uh, I can't give you the statute out of my mind, Collier, but it's the same principle as basically a manslaughter. If you hit someone and you don't stop and offer aid or try to get help, it's a pretty severe charge. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, you could get 15, 20 years for it. Yeah. But uh, at bare minimum, and like I've told many of the reporters that I've talked with, they they try they want to box you in, and I don't blame them. That's their job. Yeah. I'm really not going to say, you know, what I believe, because if I believe I have let the Smith family down, I've got to go in here with an open mind, and I've got to consider everything. Yeah. And uh, I will tell you that there's some things that are suspect, some visible things that are out public. Mr. Uh, Mr. Smith's positioning in that road you, you mentioned, 
uh, the lack of uh, damage to his clothing, his cell phone in his pocket, and it's not busted up. I mean, those are those mm-hmm. are things that I, I broke mine on the office floor. You know, I dropped yeah. it and cracked my screen. Uh, so whatever the truth is, I want to be a part of it if, if possible. Uh, if I don't want any glory, you know, if, if something I can do can help sled, I want to do it. I just want to see a smile on Miss Smith's face. And I want to know that the family has a little bit of peace. And, and that's it. I, I didn't seek, you know, some of the haters on social media, you know, oh, he's a big celebrity now. He's getting all this money. So I, I haven't got, I haven't received anything, not one penny, not even from the Murdoch case yet. Now I've got a check coming, but it takes a little while to get paid through the state process. Sure. But none of this, you know, I didn't run down Mr. Bland and Mr. Richter. They had the faith in me to ask me to help. Yeah. And just like with my men and women at work, man, I pushed the glory off to somebody else. And I, I, I'm just thankful if I was able to help you. And I'm thankful if my efforts didn't hurt you. So that, that's what I live for. I, I, I've got a pension that I could sign tomorrow. And one month from the day, I get a check. It's not about the money for me. It's about doing good for somebody. And a lot of times it's somebody you don't understand or somebody you don't know. And I think if all of us did just a little bit more of that, I think it might be a better place. And I'm not trying to get all, you know, huggy, kissy on anybody because everybody knows that's not the kind of guy I am. But I really think with the uh, atmosphere, you mentioned it earlier, with the vitriol and, and what we deal with today, I just think if we understood a little bit more about somebody that we know nothing about. Yeah. I think it would just be a better place for all of us. You know, I go back when you think about the vitriol, and I just remember watching Alec Murdaugh leave the courtroom to get into the van to 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 go to the detention facility, and somebody yelled, Buster's next! I was like, man, like what? I feel sorry for the Murdoch family. I yeah. feel sorry for Buster. I prayed for Alec. Uh, you, you know, I, look, you, you got God's law and man's law. And no matter what, you can make yourself right with God, but you still have to satisfy man's law. And I didn't make the decision guilt or innocent. That's the job of them 12 men and women, but I respect their position. And had it been the other way, I would have still respected it. And that's our system. And I, I truly believe in it. Oh, yeah, I, I believe in it. It's funny. I have a friend who works in Homeland Security. He was uh, he, before that, before DHS, he was in the FBI and DEA. I mean, he's been life, life. He's he's been like, I've been a cop my entire life, <laughs> as he says. And he he will tell me time and again, Collier. It is, it, and he just bitches about the government all the time and how at the the level of incompetence. But I'm sure you can relate to. <laughs> Well, he yes, like, sir. And he, he, he has this great quote that he tells me, and I, I will not say his name, but he's, he's a dear friend of mine. And he says, because we talk about conspiracies, and he, he works in New York City. So he's in a major metropolitan area in the world. And he talks about conspiracy theories with me sometimes, or I'll just run something by him. I'm like, hey, what do you think of this? And he goes, Collier, the notion of a conspiracy is that the people who are perpetrating said conspiracy actually know what what have any clue what they're actually doing he's like these people can't even get my paycheck right sometimes (laughs) how do you think that they are going to cover up two planes flying into towers in lower manhattan and nobody's going to find out how do you think that that's possible in the day of the internet (laughs) with all these i mean he just he says because he gets really annoyed about 9 11 conspiracies and he he just gets really frustrated and he just goes, he's like, it's so incompetent. And then in the same breath, he says to me, but as screwed up as it is, it is still, I believe, the best system in the world. And I say that all the time. Absolutely. And, and even with all this media, con- like, and I think that people lose sight of the fact that, let's take the Murdoughs. The, the, the vile and vitriol 
that has come out, and let's just say like that comment towards Bu mm -hmm. uh, referring to Buster and somehow with the Stephen Smith case, right? Because online sleuths think X, Y, and Z, let's say from their <laughs> investigations. That type of conjecture and that type of propaganda actually works in other countries. Right, right. And that's what people don't seem to understand that's really scary. And I interviewed Amanda Knox a, a, a few months ago uh, on another project and, you know, obviously her whole ordeal and just in Italy. And there's a lot of people that are very polarized. She's a very polarizing figure. I understand because of the media conjecture surrounding that case, but they, the Italian court had already arrested, tried and convicted a man who said that she had nothing to do with it, who committed that right. murder of Meredith. And I think she was convicted two or three times or they tried after, three times after. So she was right. convicted a year after he goes a year and a half after he goes to prison, mind you, for the murder with, with her with her boyfriend. And wow. then they retried her and convicted her again and then did it again. And then she was finally exonerated. And I and I use that as an example. And she was in prison for four years. Yeah. I use that as an example of like, that's what happens if we didn't have the justice system that we had. Absolutely. in this country that we have these protections i know that it is very there there's a lot of politics involved there's a lot of money that is involved and i think back to my father's case and my father having you know a a defense super legal team defense team at his disposal and i think about about what that could have looked like in like let's say the oj simpson case where he did have the highest power lawyers in the country defending him. And I think about, I'll take that any day of the week. Then somebody can say, I heard a rumor that this person did this and this, and then you go to prison for it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Collier, I can't tell you how many times uh, myself or one of my coworkers would look at, uh, just say a, a latent fingerprint, for instance, you never know where that print's going to go. But if it doesn't meet a certain standard, you're sure that is Kenny Kinsey's print, but you don't quite have enough to call it. The tie always went to the runner. Always. Well, we're not going to call that. You know, I mean, that that's the system that I know. I read and see stories about other systems where people have been hemmed up, and there's no doubt they're bad police, just like they're bad prosecutors and doctors and lawyers and every segment of our society because police come from our society and we don't have a perfect society. So why would we expect all of our police to be perfect? But what I do know is the majority of the men and women, it is still the most honorable job in my opinion in existence. And if you look, we, we spoke on the phone a month or so ago. If you look at the 20 to 30 documented citizen contacts a day with every man and woman, 700,000 plus, every man and woman in this country, the citizen contacts they have every day that don't end bad, where they don't have to shoot someone or, or they don't take a life or they don't plant evidence. I would still challenge anyone to check those statistics because it's still, it's still an honorable profession. Yeah. Honorable. Why do you think, why do you think, distrust in law enforcement has been so i mean just so rampant man we've done some bad stuff call you we we have you know we haven't made it easy on ourselves and you got one bucket of bad apples but because of uh social media and and, and not just social media but technology in general you're fed that all day you're fed it all day. So, and, and this is what I lecture on, if I may. Uh, our marginalized members of our marginalized communities are scared of the police because they've seen us do some bad things. You can't dress it up. You can't put lipstick on it. It's still a pig, yep. period. And it's bad. And then you've got the increase in ambush deaths of police officers I'm not sure the current numbers, but between 2011 and 2015, when I did my research, it was 87% increase. Wow. So you've got the marginalized community 
that rightfully doesn't trust the police. And then you've got the police that are jumpy because they're dying. And when you have crisis or conflict, it just does not end well. It doesn't end well. And so I, I don't think either one of them as a whole are wrong. I just think we've got to find another way. I tell people, look here, get paid. Cut your video on on your phone. If you come across that guy, videotape it, get an attorney and get paid. Don't get dead, get paid. If he's a bad police officer, there's nothing that good cops want to do worse than get bad cops out of there. But across this Very nation, true. across this <clears throat> nation, call your, I, I believe this with every DNA cell in my body across this nation, the men and women that carry badges and guns are for the most part good. They're, they're for the most part good. Yeah. And if I didn't believe that, I couldn't do it anymore. <clears throat> Yo, I, I, I just getting sensitive knowing you as briefly as I have it, I, I would believe that. I would go to the other side if I didn't believe that. The yeah. dark side. <laughs> the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> So let me ask you, so let me ask you a little bit about this Stephen Smith case. So you're, yes, you're brought sir. on and, you know, this is again, you know, it, it sucks. And, and, you know, when we were discussing about Murdoch's conviction, one of the things that you and I touched upon, and we'll get to Stephen in a second, sorry, but is the addiction aspect of all this and how you said when that judge said to him, I I don't believe that you committed this crime. I believe that it was the person that you created. Mm -hmm. Do you think it was, it was drug fueled? I believe drugs were part of the equation, but if you look at the amount of money and the cost of the drugs, it's a big deficit in there. It's a whole lot more things that maybe weren't uncovered or maybe wasn't brought forward. But I don't believe a person on that much medication for that long could do the tingent, uh, stringent legal work that Alec Murdoch did. I, I just I don't believe it for a second. I believe there were probably times, rough spots in his life where, you know, he dealt with that issue. But I don't think it was a 24 seven thing. The, the addiction was not right. Yes, sir. Thing? Yes, sir. I do not. Oh, so you think he was, there could have been times when he was straight. I do. Yes, sir. I, I do. Or at least the addiction was minimal or under control uh, because civil or well, criminal too. But I mean, civil work is really, really tricky. And like I said, he was, he was very good at it. it is, it's not an attorney that will tell you that his skills of persuasion uh, and selling a point he, he was top shelf and you just can't have those kind of results. If you do 340,000 oxys in a 12, 14 year period of time, you, you can't be. And not only that, it's toxic after so many an hour. So I just don't believe it. I don't know what the jury thought. I never heard their perspective on it, but I just didn't, I didn't believe that. Why do you think he did it? I believe his world was now I'm, I'm gonna preface it with this. It really to me it doesn't matter why he did it, but I, sure. I will say I formed an opinion. I believe his world was coming to an end. Uh and I do believe he loved his family. And I believe he was so embarrassed that he had uh ended the legacy, really and truly, because in the next day or two the whole world was gonna know that he was stealing and that he lost his job at the hundred year old law firm that his great grandfather, you know, started. And I think the people that he was most uh, scared of uh, embarrassing was his family and how it went down or why it started. I don't know uh, whether it was uh, some kind of situation, some kind of heated situation that just got out of hand or whether it was just calculated and planned. Uh, as I said, it was very disorganized, which would make me think it just happened and he lost it. 
but but I don't know. But I, I know that he was really, really being considered a corner post in that in that area was very, very his reputation was very, very important to him. And, you know, his family, from what I understand, may or may not have had any idea of these other things. They knew about the drug usage, but I think they thought it was under control. But the other things, they, they didn't know. And sooner or later, he was going to have to face it and tell them. And he said it on the stand. I've lied. I've lied to a lot of people. And it was getting to a point where he was running out of lies. And whether it was supposed to be Paul and Maggie, I don't know. But, you know, Paul was the catalyst for all those lies being discovered with the, uh, with the boat incident. And for once in his life, the first time in his life, he was going to have to be accountable for his finances. Huh. Yeah, I think that you, know, when you and I talked about this early, uh, on the phone the other day. When I look at my father, for example, I just go, you know, you've, you have a pregnant wife who's th almost 30 years younger than you. You have a, uh, you, 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 ha you're now about ready to make all this money. $300,000 a year in 1990 is a lot of money. Ooh, ooh, yes, sir. Lots. And he was only going to have to work a very minimal amount of hours, uh, because he was starting this practice. But I just think. Like, what did you have to gain? You had, no, you had everything to lose and nothing to gain. And, and I think in my father's case, the world was collapsing upon himself. His own perception of himself, his world was collapsing. Where you look at Alec Murdaugh, am I pronouncing it wrong? Is it Murdoch? Mur Murdaugh, Mur yeah, it's Murdaugh. Uh, oh, and it is I, Murdaugh. Don't, okay. I don't know where Alec. <laughs> come from but that's what they call him i mean it's it's clearly spelled a-l-e-x but you know i don't know they're a little bit more south than i am so i don't know <laughs> they have heavy accents for sure Anyways, yes sir so, uh it, it it feels like in the case of of alec is his world his world was coming was squeezing in around around him and my father and it was squeezing his own world. He was because he was trapped in his psychopathy and narcissism. Like my wife's not going to get away with divorcing me. I'm going to take her with me and I'm going to get everything that I want in life. Whereas Alec was like, I I'm so desperate. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, cause it, and, and that's why I think I went back to the drug thing too, is cause it was just so, he seemed so sloppy in the end, mm -hmm. just so, yeah. So yep. sloppy. I'm like, this is some drug nonsense. This is some drunk, <laughs> some drunk <laughs> bull jive, as you say. Yes, sir. Uh, so now, so when I draw parallels into that case, there's obviously a lot with my father, but this Stephen Smith scenario, and I tell people <clears throat> a lot of times because they'll, they'll say, well, you know, this happened years ago. How can the family be patient? I was like, you know, sometimes the justice system works in reverse. You got to go with what you can get, and then you can start to reverse engineer everything back from there. One of the things that really, really struck a nerve with me or a chord with me was the fact that they exhumed Stephen Smith's body last weekend. Mm -hmm. You know, this is uh, the body had been laid to rest, what, eight years ago now? Yes, sir. Seven eight and a half years. years ago? Yes, sir. The same thing happened with my mother. So in, I believe it was 1994, or 1995, I had gone, there was an autopsy that was produced uh, and my father was trying to get an appeal. And obviously my father was very good at manipulating me, but I had a lot of questions where I thought, you know, my mother's eye color was different. There, the weight was different. The height, there, there were certain measurements that were different. And I thought, I'm going to, there was a, there was an investigation in a, in a newspaper. And I thought, I think I need to know for my own peace of mind, whether this is my mother or not. And I Switch. authorized the exhumation of her body so right. they could redo an autopsy. Now, obviously it was her body. Uh, I gave DNA as did my mother's sister and it was her body, but I, and I had been so twisted around by my father at such a young age because even though I had maintained contact with him and through letters and things, and even though I had my adoptive parents protecting me from this, shielding me a little bit, I was still very twisted up inside and really trying to come to terms with what had happened. 
but I, uh, I, I, I authorize that. What does somebody, you know, after all this time, what do they hope to gain from something like this? Well, there's so, there was so many, you know, you from a small town. Yeah. Most stories have a little bit of truth and they just breed tentacles and they go in every direction. So the purpose of the second autopsy was to either include or exclude what the first pathologist, you know, there was some, uh, there was some riffraff between the pathologist and one of the investigating officers. And we're all human. You know, I, I'm not even going to speak. Maybe pathologist had a bad day. Maybe the, the officer had a bad day, but some things got documented uh, about the location of Stephen and why she made the determination that uh, he was killed, you know, by a vehicle versus pedestrian accident. And so that started the answer that was documented in the, in the report, I, I guess, fueled some rumors. Then all the things that you and I talked about, the clothing, the location, and I'm gonna tell you, you're right. This is in the middle of nowhere. The mailman probably only delivers there twice a week. That that's how far out this is, and uh, and it's dark, Collier. It's dark. There's yeah. no amb ambient light at the time. The pines were really, really high on one side, and there was some kind of crop in the field on the other side. So unless the moon was right above, there probably wasn't much moonlight, and. Uh, I mean, all those all those things rolled into one. So the purpose of this autopsy was was just to number one, you've got not just a pathologist and maybe a uh, uh, assistant. You had two or three very very reputable pathologists and anthropologists, and you did it all under chain of custody. So Mr. Smith was was uh, it, it was treated very very uh, professionally. And he was taken to a neutral area uh, out of state and they performed a complete autopsy. And I'm sure that, you know, I'm not that kind of doctor. Uh, I've got post hole digger after my name, but they're, they're <laughs> medical doctors. And I'm sure that they, uh, you know, they beat it around and they verified everything. And from what I understand, it was a complete success, which doesn't always happen after that amount of time. So they started on that side and I went back and not saying any of the officers are wrong. I went back, I took the original reports and I went back and uh, I took my agent with me and I redid all the measurements. I, I actually was within four inches, I believe, of where Mr. Smith came to rest in the road. And I walked it. I walked it one way. I walked it another way. I took every possible path from his car to that location. And I actually met some people and, and I'm not at liberty to talk about that because I still have to pass it on. But I met some folks that had some uh, some great information on the history and the landscape at that time. And hopefully it'll be helpful because, you know, a lot of things have changed in eight years, but a lot of things are still constant. And you could look in the horizon. One of the things I use, I use satellite imagery and I use Google Maps. And one of the things that uh, I honed in on, and, and a lot of people don't think about this, but you know, a pine tree grows from sapling to mature now in 20, 22 years. Yeah. And I'm, I may be off a year or two, but, but real, real fast. But your oak trees and your hardwoods grow really, really slow. So I was able to identify some hardwoods in the horizon and I used those to triangulate my spot. And then when we found the GPS marker on the uh, power pole close by, it was like four inches off. So you've got all these pink boxes out in the road that different news organizations had painted, which I think is a little disrespectful to leave there uh, in, the, in the highway for everyone to see. Mm -hmm. But not only was it a little bit disrespectful to Stephen and his family, they were in the wrong spot. So it was, you know, it was personal gratification to be able to find that location. And then we just worked backwards. We worked backwards. And when we walked 2.8 miles this way, we'd get back in the truck and measure it. 
and then we'd measure it out the other way, and then we'd walk that way. And I think we, uh, I'm, I'm still working on the report, but I gathered plenty of information to verify a lot of the facts of the original report. And when the uh, official report is uh, made access to myself and some of the other team members, I'm sure we're going to have a war room and we're going to come together and uh, we're going to put our heads together and, and figure out a couple possibilities. And then we'll include or exclude those. And if we're led down the wrong rabbit hole, we will exclude it and we'll get back on it. And I, I really am excited at the opportunity of giving the Smith family some answers. Wow. I'm, I'm really, I'm telling you, you couldn't, you couldn't give me a, 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 a hundred dollar new pony. You couldn't give me a new pony and make me happier than the opportunity to uh, give them some answers after so long. Yeah. It's um, you know, closure is a funny thing. I've had to learn that in my life. You know, I thought, <clears throat> I mean, look, I went as far as making a documentary with a two time Oscar winner <laughs> about trying to find closure. Right. And I think, you 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 end up finding that the real closure isn't necessarily in getting the answer to that question it's the journey of trying to find that answer and then making peace with what it is that you find and, and you're you're so right answer. the peace you know i know and mr bland and mr richter you know they they are phenomenal law firm and 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 law partners i know that some of these answers may be hurtful at first to Miss Smith and the Smith family. I know that. And I, I just pray that, you know, it will help them in that journey. It will help them finish that journey because they have been fighting for eight years, just yeah. screaming, somebody listen. And I, I just pray. And, and like I said, no one's ever excited about trying to get answers for a family that lost a, a young son that they love very much. But I'm as excited as you can be for a bad situation to try and get them some answers. Absolutely. Well, you know, you can tell them you have my number. You tell them they can call me on background. They don't need to be on this program. Yes, sir. I can, I can help them just with finding that piece, you know, or offer, not offer my sort of insight onto that because it's, I wouldn't wish on anybody, man. It's it's a lot. Can I say something, Collier? And, yeah, and it's a personal thing. You know, you and I've been speaking now for a while, sure. and I'm so I, I thank I thank the Lord above that uh, Jared put us in touch, because man, that dude, we have quickly became friends, uh, and I feel the same relationship with you. Oh, you man. have every reason in the world to be organically messed up. I mean, honestly, with the fight you've had and the path you have uh, had to navigate, and man, it is so refreshing and uh, and so hard, uh, so humbling to know that you fought this battle a, a long time on your own. And, and I don't know the resources, and, and I'm not doing this for all that, but I don't know the resources or help you had, but... Uh, I really respect your journey and I believe you're John Wayne. I mean, I really, really do to do what you did. And look, you're a little bit younger than me, but uh, man, I respect the fool out of you. I, I really, really do. And, uh, and I, I just, God bless you. And, uh, and I thank you for what you do. I truly do. Um, thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, mm. Well, I mean, this is, uh, that would be why I do what I do. Right? That's it. Yes, sir. That is it. That is it. So, yeah. Anyways, um, one, a couple more questions just from our audience and I'll, I'll let you get back to your evening with the, uh, with your agent. Uh, yes, John sir. Swindler asks if you, uh, please ask me if you're going to be involved in the boat crash case in August in Beaufort. No, sir. Uh, the only way I could ever work something uh, on the water is if there was a homicide on a boat, you know, but uh, I haven't been asked and, and I believe that's pretty much taken care of. They have the answers in that. And it's just the, uh, it's probably just going to be the civil part in the courtroom, but uh, I was not asked to do that. And uh, I'm going to be spectator. I'm, I'm going to sit back and watch and see what happens there. 
Is that actually going to trial? I believe probably. Uh, I don't really know about the civil side because it's so many settlements and so many different attorneys fighting for their clients. So I'm not really sure. But uh, I've heard rumor that it, it may or, it, you know, it may and it may be real soon. So it's a, is it posthumously charging Paul? Well, it's not it's not the criminal part. It's the oh, civil it's not, side. It the civil side. Yes, okay. yes. Or it go, I guess going against the estate, the insurance companies and that kind of thing. But uh, like I said, Mr. Tinsley is a bulldog and I got mad respect for him. So we're going to sit back and we're going to be a spectator and a supporter in this one and see what happens. That's that sounds like a great plan, actually. So what is uh, looking for a few more questions here from people. But uh, what is your what I mean, thank you, obviously, for doing what you're doing with Stephen's family, because that's incredible. And, and that young man, at, at least they just deserve that piece. What is next for you outside of all of this? Like just Kenny and the age. Well, I'm going to be a granddaddy in oh. July. Uh, my daughter is with child and everything, everything is, is wonderful. And, uh, you know, if you saw the, uh, all the reports, the mini Kenny <laughs> that, uh, Miss Truesdale made, uh, we actually, went to dinner with her and her family Sunday and she gave me the mini Kenny mini Kenny. So that, that is going to be my grandson's first doll. Aww. And, uh, I'm just excited, man. I'm just excited. Uh, family's growing good times, you know, thinking about, uh, thinking about a retirement opportunity from carrying a, a badge and we still going to work for people. And, uh, you know, like I said, we mentioned haters earlier. Some of the haters say, oh, you shouldn't say victims. Well, it's victims whether they're seeking justice or whether they're wrongly accused. So when I can't say I'm going to work for victims anymore, I'm going to sit on the front porch and hunt and fish forever or until God takes me home. But right now, man, my family and I are traveling and we're doing some speaking engagements. Uh, going to be out in Alabama in uh, October for the Attorney General's Conference. I'm speaking to a coroner's picnic in April. And then I've actually got the South Carolina Legal Investigators Conference in Myrtle Beach in May. So, you know, I don't know why they want me there to talk, but <laughs> I'm willing to help. And I'm, I'm always willing to help law enforcement and, and attorneys. So I've got a lot of folks reaching out and we're doing a lot of death reviews. Uh, I'm just excited. It's been wonderful. And, and I'm, I'm just humbled that people are putting their trust in me to help try and find them some answers. And like I told Creighton Waters when, uh, when he told me I was getting on the stand that day, I might not be able to give them every answer they want, but I promise I won't hurt them. And I'm going to deliver. If there's a possibility of delivering, I'm going to deliver. It's in me and I can't accept failure. So, uh, I'm going to do the best I can for every client I have. And we're just going to see where it takes us. That is a great way to end this interview. Dr. Kenny Kinsey or Kenny, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for so much for sharing and opening up to my audience or our audience. Uh, I know they all loved you. I was popping them up on the, everybody saying congratulations and uh, uh, about your grand about your grandchild. So um, thank you so much for joining the program. I really appreciate it. Thank you, my friend. And I hope to talk with you real soon. Sounds good. Hey, you tell Creighton, I want to, I want to have him on here. Then we can talk about guitars too. I will put Creighton in touch with you, sir. <laughs> thank you so much. We'll see have you. Have a great friend. night. Be you safe, too. brother. Yes, sir. You too. Thank you. My guest tonight, for those of you that are just joining or, or, or just caught that, that is Dr. Kenny Kinsey. He was uh, one of the expert witnesses in the Murdoch trial. He is currently working on the case with Stephen Smith and their family. And I cannot believe he said what he said to me because I was about ready to lose it. <laughs> I think you guys probably saw that. Uh, what a wonderful, wonderful guest he was. I'm just so grateful to have him on the program. So... Uh, thank you all for tuning in and thank you all for joining me on this the now the second live uh, of Moving Past Trauma. Thank you all so much. Uh, this was, I hope you guys really enjoy this. And uh, thank you to my channel members. Thank you to my Patreon supporters. Thank you to all of you who took your time to tune in and join me for this one. On that note, 
I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Trauma. Thanks, y'all.